Hello and welcome to Friday's edition of a Celtic State of Mind. And as you can see from the personalities involved, it's a different three amigos today. Laura Bradburn is currently on holiday and is missing out for the first time since December, as she informed us on social media. So she's left it in my Kenny Everett in capable hands. <laughs> and we'll see what happens. But first and foremost, I'm delighted to welcome back after a wee hiatus, Jim Orr. How are you, Jim? Good, Tony. Afternoon. Good to be back. Yeah. Yeah. And also, we've made a transfer swoop overnight. <laughs> we've placed Laura Bradburn. And it's the resident rascal himself, Russell Boyce, who informs us that he's been working for a Celtic state of mind every day this week, almost, apart from... Oh, yeah. I think it has been, mate. I think I've been on various shows that Paul provides us with this week. So I've done the bulletin, the post-match, and Scream of Celica as well. So two bulletins now. Fair enough. Well, My overtime pay packet should look good next week. <laughs> well, I'm going to come to Jim first and get an overall take, Jim, on what you've witnessed so far. We played four, got our first one last night against Jablonich, very welcome win. But uh, I wanted to get gather your take on the Michelin debacle and the Hearts result. I say debacle, but obviously being put out of Europe, the Champions League, not great, but an inauspicious start in the league. But what, what's your thoughts so far, Jim, on, on what's what's happening? I think a big angel they heard you use that word, I just stoated you, basically. What do you mean, debacle? I think... Uh, Probably would have. A lot's happened in a few weeks, uh, and I think the reaction in some quarters has been bordering on hysterical. I think we just need to calm down. It's a time for cool heads. Open three games, disappointing in terms of results, and it's a results-driven business. So if you don't win games, you're going to you know, invite lots of anger amongst the fans. But I thought, I thought they played really well in those three games, but for a few individual mistakes by the players and the officials, would have won the three games. If we won the three games, nobody would be complaining. So I thought it was a bit hysterical. Uh, uh, we've got a mess to clean up. You know, I, I don't blame Dom, I don't blame Ange. I mean, what we're looking at just now is Lowell's legacy, Lennon's legacy. Uh, and Dom and Ange are just in the door. So you need to give them a bit of time to clean up their messes because there's some mess, absolutely atrocious mess that these guys have left. And I think now is a time when supporters need to support to use that tagline that the Celtic shop use. It's, it's dead easy to support a team when you're winning. But when you're not winning, and it's a bit more difficult, you need to get behind the team. Uh, I just felt, I said a few weeks ago, that I didn't watch any of the friendly games. I wasn't interested in the friendly games because that was all about getting minutes and legs. As they say, I thought, we'll see where we are at half time in the first Mitchell game. I was fortunate enough to come out the ballot. So I was at the game. And I was 30 yards from Beaton when he, when he put his hands up, which, which changed the whole game. So, so Beaton puts his hands up, Barkas puts his hands down. You don't do that. Don't, they don't do that. It's a completely different result. And at half time, we're, we're still playing Beaton at centre half. He gets sent off and bring on a 19 year old kid. That's where we were at half time. That's, that's the law legacy. You know, so I don't, don't blame the players at all. Uh, watching the game, uh, I was behind the back and his goal in the first half and it was a heart attack football for the first 15 minutes for me. There was an incident where I think Beto had a bye kick and he was taken out on the left-hand side and Barkas just moved right to the edge of the box and he plays the ball to Barkas and the Mitchelland players were starting to come in and Barkas plays it back to him and there's nobody in goals. You know, the goals are right in front of you, nobody in goals. So I think we're going to get punished for that at some point in time because it's heart attack stuff to watch. But after the first 15 minutes, I thought we grew into the game, played quite well, got the goal, and then beat on does his, you know, ridiculous uh, act. Barkas does his bit, Eddie misses his chance. And again, we should have won. We don't win. And an exact repeat in Mitchelland, you know, play well, score a good goal, Forrest misses a chance, they score, momentum changes, we lose the game. I just thought we're dead unlucky over those two games. The Hearts game... I thought he picked a good team to play Hearts, an experienced team to play Hearts. I maybe would have left it a badder because you're looking for a bit more physicality at Tyne Castle. I maybe played Ryan Christie. But you know what to expect with Hearts? We'll come out the, out the gates flying the first 15, 20 minutes and that's him burnt out. And they do that every single game. Unfortunately, we lost a goal, but we dominated. Totally dominated the game. We're just lacking a bit of a cutting edge up front. David Turnbull, two great chances, two good cutbacks with Taylor and Ralston. Made a mess, and then Rolfe scores a brilliant goal. And then officials, I mean, I've got no issue with the offside goal because, you know, these things happen in a split second. But 
the Bobby Madden decision, that guy should never referee a game again. I'm not just saying that because it's a Celtic player. If it was Ryan Kent, they get hit there, or Martin Boyle, they get hit. Referee 10 yards away with a tackle like that. You know, people call the Scottish League a Farmers League. We'll see if we're going to allow that. It is a Farmers League. So he goes off the bat, it's a different game. It doesn't, he stays on, and we lose a goal from a set piece as we've done all last season. And, and hey ho, I thought over the piece, we played really well, deserved to win that game as well. Last night, I thought the opposition were awful. I couldn't believe how bad they were. Uh, thought we played well, uh, lose us really, really silly goal, uh, amateurish goal. Uh, thought Joe Hart could have done better with that. I mean, he just seemed to stand. Rather than come out and do the old kind of starfish bit, he just kind of like stood and said, well, which corner do you want to hit it in, pal? You know, but apart from that, I thought he was okay. We got the third goal, we looked really good. And obviously, Charlie Mulgrew says that's the game over. Then, Sod's Law mm-hmm. will lose another goal. I thought Hart was okay with that one. I think if I hadn't hit Ralston, he likely got it. I thought Beaton could have done a bit better. And then Ryan Christie getting the goal at the end made it a wee bit better. But I think we'll take a few off of that team uh, on Thursday. But we've got some new guys in the door. Is it, is it, is it five signings I think we've made now? Uh, Abada, Starfelt, Fiogo, who we should call Yogi, by the way. Uh, James McCarthy, Joe Hart, so good signings. I said last time I was on, I was looking for you know battle hardened, experienced players, and, and whether you think Hart and McCarthy are good, bad, or indifferent, or Starfield, I think they qualify as battle hardened, experienced pros. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad they're in. And Fiola last night, I thought was thought was great, really good movement. A badder has hit the ground running. So encouraging signings. I think we've played well. I think we just need to calm down a wee bit as a support and get behind the team. And my big concern, and I managed to get a ticket for Sunday, and before people go crackers, it's my brother-in-law, Paul, can he make it? He's from London. So I wasn't in the ballot, but I've got a ticket. I'm looking forward to it because there'll be a big crowd there. I think it's, what, is it 25,000 or something we're getting on Sunday? So that'll be good. And what I hope happens is we don't get on the players' backs. We don't get on the team's backs. We get behind them. And if we lose a daft goal, we don't start blaming. We get behind, you know, this is the time to support the team. Uh, we've made a poor start in the league. Let's not make it any worse. I think we'll do well, and obviously we'll come on to Saturday's game later on. I think we'll do well on Saturday. Parkhead, big open park, lots of pace up front. Win that game, beat St Mirren, beat Hearts, and then we can set up for the season. So that's my initial take on the season so far. That's a magnificent seven minutes there, Russell. The voice of sanity and reason. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> he talks, he's worth listening to. Your ears just also, play. also, if you notice, I'm no longer in a uh, <laughs> drug crack den so I've, I've moved out from that now so I'm now okay. thank you for all those who've commented in the past about Jim's living in a drug den a junkie's flat I've moved out and I'm fine now thank you <laughs> new laptop as well Jim new wife new laptop good to go I feel like a DJ no. now pop pick no. <laughs> that, that was a splendid opening seven minutes salvo there Jim loved that Russell uh, you spoke last night after the game and you gave your your, your thoughts. Now, Jim spoke there about battle-hardened. You mentioned a player last night, and I'm going to mention my phrase again, a person of interest to me, Gary Cahill. He should be at the top of your list. If you want to bolster that defence with a battle-hardened central defender, look no further than Gary Cahill. And if you can sing Joe Hart, you can maybe entice Gary Cahill, Cahill north of the border. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, if it's not Gary Cahill, then I would like it to be someone of a similar sort of profile. Um, we need an experienced defender in there. I think with a wee bit of know-how of, of sort of how... But I know, I, I, admittedly, he's not played in Scotland before, but someone who has, is not going to uh, take time to adapt to British football, if you like. I think Cahill, someone who's a free agent right now. I think... The difference is with, with Cahill signing now is if you'd said it to me 12 months ago, I would have said no way would Celtic look at Gary Cahill as a potential signing. However, there seems to have been a shift in the transfer strategy um, from Celtic this summer. And whilst Jim rightfully was crying out for battle-hardened players, I don't think any of us were that convinced we would we'd bring in mm. two guys, a 30-year-old and a 34-year-old, on a three- and a four-year deal, respectively. I think that's a sign that there is change occurring in terms of how Celtic go about their business uh, with, recru- with regards to recruitment. And I think we have to be honest and say it's a welcome change because I just feel that we've got a lot wrong 
whilst there's been the odd gem, I think we've got a lot wrong in the transfer market. And look, every signing you make that comes with a potential, you know, disaster at looming ahead. I mean, every every signing is a gamble. But I think Gary Cahill comes with. I don't know. I think the chances of him having a Shane Duffy esque season are very slim. I think he would certainly work in tandem with Hart. I certainly think that defence is needing a leader. I think that is fair. We were all raving about the uh, the sort of mental attributes of Joe Hart when he joined. We all, we all would say his best days and, and goals. So far, we would think are behind him. Everyone can come back, though. You never know. But the mental attributes that he brought, the leadership qualities that he brings, were the, the, the bits that excited the fans the most, I think. And why not have another one in there when it's a position that we are crying out to get filled right now? Right, Right-footed, centre-half, Gary Cahill, right now, ticks the boxes for me. Um, I would be affordable. I know it's very short-termism, but while Stange is developing his strategy, developing his plans, we need players brought in that can get the job done in the meantime. This is, as we've been told, constantly is going to be a long project. Well, you can't get them all in in the summer, so there's going to need to be just... Uh, in some areas of the park, stopgap situations, and Gary Kell to me would be a, a no brainer for that role, Tony. Do you see it as a no brainer yourself, Jim? You see the battle hardened type that you would welcome at Celtic decided to make a move? He qualifies as battle hardened. I think we're in a, we're in a needs must situation just now. Uh, we can't afford to, to drop too many points. I think we need to be in and around it. Uh, my big concern is that. We end this month no more than three points behind. Uh, having lost three points there, that makes it a bit more difficult. So we can't mess around. We have to get guys in as soon as possible. And if you're talking about experienced England internationals, albeit a few years ago, then you know I've got, I've got no issues with bringing someone like Cahill in. Uh, and as you guys have said, I mean, there's been a different strategy all of a sudden. And uh, it's interesting, again, to see who is Angie's guys and who are not Angie's guys. I don't mean not Angie's guys and that he doesn't want them, but I mean guys that he'd identified. And obviously Kyogo, yes. Barry, Starfield are his guys. Joe Hart, James McCarthy, you know, I can hesitate to call them lazy signings. If it was last year, I'd have called them lazy signings because it's people that we know about, you know, and I'm looking for a, a scouting network that can scour the world and, and find all these gems, you know. So I know about Joe Hart, I know about James McCarthy, and if I know about them and they sign them, not to say that they're a bad signing, but I always think that's a bit lazy because it's just kind of too easy. But notwithstanding that, I think Hart and McCarthy are exactly who we need just now. And Cahill, I think we come into that same boat as well. But we need to get them in quickly because we can't afford to fall too far behind. Mm-hmm. I think, as I said, we'll take care of Thursday. So it'll be the next game against is it Alkmaar. I want to make sure we've got a decent team and give ourselves a decent chance to get through that. Because you're looking at a long, hard season over 38 games. So, as I say, we can't give our major rival too much of a start because it'll be far too difficult to claw that back. So let's just try and keep in there. And to keep in there, I think we need as many players as possible to help the big man out. Because I think he's fantastic, Ange. Everything he says, the way he says it, how he says it, he's been superb. And all he needs now is a few results. And I think once he gets the results, I think we'll take off. But yeah, Cahill, tick for me, yeah. Russell, you, we spoke off camera and you said that Ange himself mentioned about that adaption, you know, after the game last night. We came in for a bit of stick on Monday because we were talking about <laughs> adapting and, and getting the personnel into suit, you know. But we stand by everything that we said on Monday and you, and you rightfully brought up that Ange himself mentioned it in the aftermatch last night. Yep, and said last night that we need to start working smarter. Um, and what he was referring to was the openness of the defence. Um, it's you know it's it's quite obvious, I think, with the the two signings that we've just discussed as well. Um, that Ange definitely is adapting, and that's what good managers do. And I've got no reason to believe that Ange isn't a good manager. So it's nice to see that you know exactly what we were saying on Monday. You know, that was what we were alluding to, shall I say, on Monday. We weren't saying that, you know, oh, you just completely change everything because you're playing in Scottish football. But it's a madhouse of a league. It's an absolute madhouse. And what works in one league probably won't work in Scotland. And I'm not saying that because the standards necessarily um, higher than the J League or the A League. But it's bonkers. 
And we all know we've watched it for you know all our lives, and you know fine well that in the in the Scottish League, it takes a real blend to get the right eleven in the Scottish League. You know, you couldn't just do it with you know a bunch of twenty one year olds say that well project signings is still wrong, but I don't think that would happen. I think you need you need to mix it up a bit, and I don't think going gung ho football would have worked either in particular. And, and I think you know the the fact that Anne just talked about working smarter should be really encouraging for Celtic fans right now because he has not been in the door long. Mm. Let's get that absolutely right. He's not been in the door long, but he didn't win any of his first three games either, which, well, definitely, he's recognised that's not good enough. He's adapting, and we see a victory, albeit I thought at times he'll still be wanting the defence tightened up. We've spoken about adding personnel to that. I certainly think in the... The way that the the two centre half seem to be splitting, they seemed miles apart at times. I felt um, last night, so I'm sure he's looking at all sorts of ways. He's alluded to it now. Uh, he wants to work smarter. It's really encouraging as a fan that you've got a manager there that's recognising um, areas that we need to improve and happy to implement them. And that's the language that fans like to hear, isn't it? After yep. the winning the first three games, you say he's going to work smarter. That talks to you as a part of that, lets you know what his thinking is. And as Jim says as well, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> yeah. Jim says as well, <laughs> sorry about that, Jim. That's your dealer. Yeah. <laughs> and as Jim says as well, it comes across really, really well at times. You know, and it, it, if he's going to do that as a manager, then the Celtic supporters will buy into this. And we'll give them time. I, I yep. in the Celtic way yesterday saying the Ange Postecog Blue Revolution has taken off because now he's got his first win. And as Jim said there, he thinks that they can take off. And one of the reasons for that is the forward three yesterday going forward and Kyogo Furuhashi in particular. Now, that was only Kyogo's first start. He played 12 minutes at Tyne Castle and he scored, for me, a goal that was touch of class stamped all over it. I don't care what MD says and the, the level of opposition, but you cannot teach what he did there. The pass from Beaton, the awareness to see the defender and the first touch to take it away and a small bit of room to produce that finish, Jim. It was class, wasn't it? It was very good, yeah. Uh, I think the only thing that I'm a bit concerned about is a lack of physicality in the squad, never mind the team, you know, and I think... I think what Andrew will learn pretty quickly is there's, there's two types of games he's going to have to play in the SPFL. At home, you can be as expansive as you want to be and you go for the big wide Celtic park. But if you go away, most of the games are in tight parks and there's a lot of physicality about it. You know, whether it's Tyne Castle you're going to or you know wherever, maybe apart from the Ibrox. But, so I think there'll be even more physicality. I'd like to see him can maybe try and obviously he's just in the door, so my expectations is not not at the moment. But in time to try and mix it up a wee bit. Uh, I don't think the guy's a centre forward. I think he's a number ten. Kyogo, I think he's sitting a bit back. Uh, I like the idea of playing four three three as long as the right players to play it. Uh, but I think it'll be a revelation playing middle of the park. I think it'll be a revelation playing at Celtic Park. Uh, as I said, maybe not so sure away from home. Well, as I said, it's a bit more physical. So I think what we mentioned, Ange adapting, I think he's going to have to adapt all the time. So it's not as a, mm-hmm. a matter of just doing it once. I think every game will, will give will give different challenges. And I thought Tyne Castle there, I thought, you know, he, he was a strange substitution to make in that last 12 minutes, whatever he got. You know, I mean, I thought it was a strange one to do. And I thought Kennedy, maybe should have marked his card a wee bit. A bit, a bit time castle, uh, a bit more physicality. Did. But to answer the question before I get another tangent, uh, very excited uh, in terms of the lad as a number 10. Uh, I thought last night was a kind of knees must. Again, Eddie's chopped it. We all know Eddie's chopped it. And I said said after the last Ibrox game, he should never wear his Celtic jersey again uh, because he's, he's, his head's somewhere else. And as JP said before, his feet should follow. Uh, and if you like, I mean, I don't, I don't actually blame Eddie. I mean, if I was Eddie, on the verge of a big, a big move somewhere. I don't want to get injured, you know. And you've only got to look at what happened last week with that tackle last week. That could have, you know, you know, had serious damage on it, Carl McGregor. So if you're Eddie and you're looking at that thinking, I don't, I don't want involved in that. You know, I went out of here and out of here quick. So I think we have to do what we can to move the guy on. And, and this is back to the low legacy. 
I mean, I'm sure Dom is trying everything he can to get Eddie out the door and get a good fee for him. But it's not that easy. And that's the thing when I was talking about not being on for the last few weeks. Some of the stuff on social media, you know, getting this, but just pay for a million and get them. It's not that simple. These things are quite complex, you know. And, 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 and modern day transfers are really, really complex. If you're Dom McKay and you walk in the door, it's a complete eye opener in terms of how you actually manage to get these things. And I'm, I'm astonished. Uh, we get something like Starfield in from Ruben Kaz. And I'm thinking, how, how, how complex must that deal have been to have gotten that done? So you can't do these things in two minutes. These things take a bit of time. Just unfortunate, maybe it took a wee bit longer than we'd have liked. And maybe if Starfield would have played against Mitchell and it a different result. But uh, yeah, I'm excited by him. Uh, thoughts of Lubo when you see his movement. Uh, he's, he's, he's not a centre forward, needs must last night. But get him in that number 10 role and at Celtic Park, I think it'll be an absolute revelation. Yeah. Russell, the start line says, will Kyogo Furuhashi solve Celtic's odds on Edward Headache? Jim's alluded to there that he sees him more as a number 10. You watched a lot of him when you heard they'd signed and you told me that you, th- you reckon we had a player in our hands. Do you see him more as a number 10 rather than an out-and-out centre-forward? But the good thing is he can play. He looks as if he can play both. And, yep. you know, both kind of roles and that's that's great for Celtic moving forward. Yeah, absolutely crucial. We've got players in the attacking positions right now. Um, all of them seem to be able to play at least a couple of roles in the side. You know, you've got Jamesy now playing on the left, where we would always associate Forrest with playing on the right. You've got a badder, we're told, can play either the left, the right, or through the middle as well. Kyogo, to me, looks like he could play. I think he came on in the left at Tyne Castle. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly can see where Jim's coming from with the number 10. Um, but you've got to see, you liked what you've seen of him um, when he was playing up front. Uh, and to me, it's actually quite funny because I actually felt he did had, had a bit of physicality up front, even though he's lightweight in terms of his actual, you know, his weight, his size or whatever. But he put himself about. And he wasn't afraid to put his foot where it hurts. Uh, and I thought some of his movement off the ball, whilst you're not always going to receive the ball every time, he's given the, he's asking questions of defenders all 90 minutes that he plays or however long he, he played for. Um, he's asking uh, questions of the defenders he's up against all the time. He's got them second-guessing himself. And that's because he's, his movement is very varied. It's because he looks very comfortable coming short for the ball. He looks like he'd be quite happy to run in behind. And if we've got a guy that we, we're looking to replace Edward to, let's not kid ourselves on, still got 26 goals on a poor side last year. You know, we need those goals replaced. I'm excited about what I've seen with that finish from Kyogo, that it could be him who is going to take up some of that mantle. I'm not trying to put too much pressure on him by any, any means, by the way. We've also just reintroduced James Forrest after basically last season out. Forrest is the type of guy that gets you 15 to 20 goals. We've seen with his finish, it's instinctive. Um, excuse me, last night, as was Abadas, who seems to have that already, I think, that, that, that knack for, you know, he, he hits his shot, it's a good save, but he's instinctively waiting on that rebound straight away. Um, and he finishes with a plum. Two goals already for him. I appreciate he's only 19 years old, so again, I'd be wary of putting too much pressure on there. But if you can get the sort of James Forrest of old's numbers back in, and there's no reason to suggest from what we've seen so far, he won't hit the ground running again, uh, James Forrest. Um, and then you've got a badder who has begun so well with two goals in four games. You're looking at that with Kyogo's finish. You're combining that and you think all they need is good ammunition now. Get the, because I think the, the front three look, it looks a dynamic trio and I quite like I quite like the fact that they all seem capable of playing in more than one position. So whilst I wouldn't say Kyogo's a number nine or number ten, uh, definitely, I did like what I seen of him up front. For me, it was the it was the real game intelligence that all three showed. Russell, you touched upon it there. It was the, the what they did when they weren't on the ball. <laughs> and the runs that they were making and just trying to influence the play whenever it came in the final third. And I always look at that as much as anything else. You can score goals, but it can mask poor performances. But I gave all three, I had to give them ratings, and all three of them get an eight because they were the mm-hmm. three guys that influenced the play the most. 
the mm-hmm. Celtic performance last night, in my opinion. Jim, would you say the same? I think, I mean, I've just looked at the tagline for the first time here, the odds in Edward headache. Mm-hmm. I, I, I think Ange has a headache with Edward because he's, he's, he's easily the most talented player, but his head's not in it. So what do you do? And that is a headache. And, and watching watching the Hearts game last week, see if we had Liam Boyce, we'd have won the game last mm-hmm. week. Somebody who was determined, chased every ball down, gave the defenders a bit of a nightmare. The same in the Mitchell in game. Shevchenko, Sviachenko, strolled through the game. Now, Edward didn't get near him. Whereas it was a Liam, I'm, I'm not saying we should sing Liam Boyce, by the way, but <laughs> a Liam Boyce, somebody with bags of effort and energy and chasing people down and busting a gut. That's what we need. And Edward isn't doing that. And because Edward's not doing that, then that's a headache. So we really need somebody centre forward. I think we need a centre forward. And hopefully somebody, as I said, with a bit of physicality, because sometimes, a lot of the times, if you can't pass through teams and you can't pass round teams, you have to pass over teams. And there's no big guys in the centre, so that's a waste of time. So somebody, a bit of physicality, a bit of height, with good feet, hopefully we fit into Angie's system. But uh, Kyogo, Kyogo for me is a 10. Play him behind the new centre forward, whoever he is. I agree with that, Jim, because I also thought you said at the top of the programme that I thought he picked the horses for Colsey's team at Tynecastle. It should have been good enough if, yeah. if they all played, but Eddie decided yeah. not to play. Yeah. And that's why I still think that they need, as you say, a physical presence up top. Because I yeah. think Bada, Kuruhashi and Forrest will be flair players this season mm-hmm. and will do their fair bit and score their fair amount of goals. But there will be times when you will have to mix it up back to Russell as well and Ange adapting to suit in certain games because that's also Tony sorry Anybody? that's also Tony that's why you can never go long if you're playing wee guys up front because yeah. all you're just doing is giving the ball back to the opposition so yeah. it takes one potential weapon out of your arsenal to do that so I'm not saying we should sign some big plug like play up front somebody with a bit of mobility mm-hmm. a bit of yeah. physicality a bit of speed again these kind of players must be out there whether that's mm-hmm. Kevin Nisbet yeah. I've not seen yeah. enough of Kevin Nisbet to know whether he fits the bill or not our scouts should know those players, Jim. Our scouts should know that, they whoever they are. Yeah. Like that, to Ange, or Ange should be able to say, look, I know the guy, I know who we need. Yep. Let's go yep. get them. Yep. Russell, you agree with that? Yeah, totally. Um, I think, again, you need to have different varieties of, of, of players for each position. You know, I think obviously up front, we, I think, so, like I said, as much as Q go put yourself about, physicality would be a, a, another attribute I'd be looking for if we were to sign another centre forward um, as I don't think the other options we've got in that position particularly provide that either. Although Ajet is, he's shown signs of having decent work rate and applying himself, he then other times has looked disinterested. I'm not quite sure exactly what type of striker Ajet is yet. We were told he was a penalty box poacher when he first signed and he was someone who was just going to concentrate solely on scoring goals. We were then told, um, I think it was by one of the stats, uh, I, I can't remember if I read it or it was on, on Axel, that Ajeti would actually fit the system implemented by Ange because he does a lot of tracking back, which doesn't really go hand in hand. But I suppose you need 11 guys working hard now. But if it were me, I would definitely be saying, you, you know, you're absolutely right, scouts should have a, a keen eye and a list already identified of potential new forwards Whilst I think Hugo, in answer to the, the banner's question, I think has shown fantastic signs that he can solve a lot of the headache that Odds and Edwards situation is creating, I would still get another um, another forward done before the close of the window. Although, from what I've seen so far, I'm not as panicked by that, that position as perhaps what you would have been had you not seen the impressive displays that the front three have shown. Now, the midfield has been causing some consternation amongst a few of the Celtic supporters. David Turnbull in particular. Jim, people saying he's had a, a poor start to the season by his very high standards. I don't know what you've thought of Turnbull's contribution so far, but a lot of people are saying that he might not suit the way Ange wants to play, yet this was the guy that people were saying at the end of last season, going to build the team around him, stuff like that. So... Is that knee-jerk? Is that panic again, Jim? Is that kind of over-the-top hysterics? I think there's some substance in that. I think he has been poor. Uh, two good chances at Tynecastle. 
Mm-hmm. Last week, good cause I said before, Taylor cut back, Ralston cut back. You know, not like the David Turnbull of old. You'd have thought he'd have got them in target. He just, he just seems to be off it a little bit. Who knows why? That's the case. Uh, maybe last season took a lot out of him. He obviously he'd missed a season through injury. And who knows? All these things are quite complex. You know, I think, did he not catch COVID as well at some point last season and what have you? And maybe the fact that Moore's expected of him this year. He's the kind of go-to guy. Mm-hmm. Whereas last year, he was the kind of young guy coming into the team and full of experienced pros. Now, all of a sudden, those guys have disappeared and a lot on his shoulders. And uh, I thought he's, he's, he's kind of played okay, but not as good as he could play. Uh, and his shooting's been really off, which was one of his stronger points last year. Scored two or three really good goals from, from distance. That's actually one of my bugbears about footballers these days, the fact that they can't hit the target for 20 yards. I mean, what do they do all week? You know, they <laughs> coach to do that. And then so that when it comes to the game, just get it in target. And you see people ballooning the ball, you know, 30 yards over the bar and stuff like this. And you think, anyway, Turnbull, I think there's a wee bit off it this season, Tony. I don't know why that is, but I think we've got loads of options in there. So I think he can be certainly taken out. I think Ryan Christie's been brilliant every game he's played. Plays his heart out. I'd like to see him stay. I'm a Ryan Christie fan. Uh, and we've talked about about this on Axon before about how how little he earns compared to the rest of the team. You know, I think he's on maybe uh, less than half what Tom Rogers getting on, for example. So I think give him a decent contract, he might stay. Uh, I'd like to see him stay because he he brings something to the team nobody else brings. I think um, he's got loads of dig about. Him. I'd actually play him up front before I played Edward uh, because I think he knows the way to go. Um, yeah, I like his contribution when he came on. He you know, Roderick didn't make much of a contribution, but Ryan Christie wanted that header. In the last we also year. talked about the cross, players last season who had, two, who had an appetite for it. Sorry, on you go, Jim. No, sorry, I, I'm struggling with my kind of hearing here. Uh, I, we also talked about players last season who, who's, whose attitude wasn't too clever. His was great. His was his was first yeah. class. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what you want. You want guys like that are going to drive on and, and do their best and take a chance. I've, I've, I've used the phrase uh, too many risk averse players. He takes risks. And if you take risks, you're sometimes going to lose the ball. You're sometimes going to blow the ball 20 yards over the bar. But at least he's taking things on. There's been so many. In fact, there's been a few games, that, even this earlier this season, you're thinking, hit the ball. Just hit it. And we've played maybe one or two many passes. You know, So we need, need to take a punt at goal a wee bit more. And Turnbull's usually very good at that. So it's been surprising that he's maybe just a wee bit less. I mean, I think he's played okay, but just not as good as Russell. he can play. You know? Russell, I agree with Jim in the sense that... Uh, you cannot underemphasize Christie's contribution yesterday. That fourth goal gives you the real breathing space. Because as Jim said, I don't think Jablonics were very good. But at 3-2, they would have came to Parkhead, still want to tie it. 4-2, it's a kind of ominous task for them to score three against Celtic and, and come away with a win. But that gives you that breathing space again. And Christie made that ball his. He wanted that header. He wanted to score that goal. He wanted to make an impact. And in every game this season, I think he's done very well, Christie. Yeah, I think he's made a really good start. Um, I think since he, since the season started, Ryan Christie has been very easy for to go down the, the road that we've discussed about Edward because at the end of the day, Christie's contract's up mid-season, not uh, not next season. So Or next summer, I should say. So he's got, technically, if you take the attitude of, hey, I'm not going to hurt myself, I'm not going to get myself injured, I could be, you know, a big contract offer away if I do, you know, if, 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 if I were to pick up an injury. So the differences in attitudes uh, attitudes are stark, at least whilst we do have Ryan Christie and knows he can play him, um, he can trust him to give his all, he could trust him to make differences, get important goals like he did last night. Um, the flip side is, are you really wanting to get it when you're trying to build this new team? Are you really wanting to be doing it around a guy that's unlikely to be there even for the second half of this season? If not, maybe gone before the window uh, closes this summer. Um, if they can, if they think there's an opportunity to renew the contract, I would be surprised. The vibe that I I get from it personally is that he will leave. I think, but. I could be. I get a lot wrong, so I could be well wrong there again. But I wonder if he was showing any sort of signs. And I suppose he certainly is on the park showing signs that he's committed to the cause. If Celtic were to then go back in and say, "Look, we're going to give you an opportunity to build a team," 
uh, you know, as with you as one of the key experienced heads now. You know, it'll take a four year deal, we'll put you on Tom Rogic's wages or whatever it may be. Uh, you know, that 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 obviously rewards him for the, the number of goals, assists that he's already contributed in his Celtic career. And we'll see how it goes from there. <laughs> <I think laughs> right, uh, my wife is trying to rescue me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I could just see your eyes going left. Like Ivar has just decided to drop in on the show. <laughs> bring back Laura and bring her oh, back now. <laughs> Sorry. I was going to echo, echo Russell's sentiments about Christie. I think he fits really well into the Ange system. He's high mm-hmm. energy, you know, he works really hard for the team. As I said, he's not afraid to kind of take risks and then take chances. I think no. maybe the difference between between Ryan and maybe Eddie is a, I think everyone in the world, but I think most of the major clubs in, in Europe know about Eddie, you know, all time sc- top scorer for the French on 21s, you know, class is permanent, you know, form is temporary. So people know Eddie's there. It's a matter of coming to get him. But I think Ryan Christie's still maybe trying to get that move. And maybe that explains a bit more about why he's willing to maybe you know, try a bit harder than, than Eddie. It wouldn't be hard yeah. to try harder than Eddie, to be fair. But uh, I'm a big fan of Christie and hopefully I'd like to see him stay. Yeah. Russell, what's your thoughts on Turnbull? I mean, Jim hit the nail on the head there. It's very uncharacteristic with his shooting and, he, and his performances as well, but mm-hmm. he just seems to have gone off the boil at the wrong time when everybody's trying to impress a new manager and and cement and nail down a regular first-team starting place. Now, with McCarthy coming in, I've heard, I mean, people are saying, well, McCarthy can come in and place a Turnbull or Sorrow at this moment, mm-hmm. which can allow Cal Mack to influence the play going forward which he's very good at and has done it very well but he's still kind of holding back because he's no sure of the presence uh-huh. in, the, in the, the back line but I mean, where do you see McCarthy fitting into this? Do you see him coming in at the expense of Turnbull or Sorrow? Or? I think at this moment in time um, it would be David Turnbull who stepped out and I think Ange may well be very tempted to see what Callum McGregor could do in that role. I appreciate Tom Rogic is there, who Ange has worked with, remember, at international level, so knows him inside out. You would imagine he has still got a fair amount of faith in what, what Rogic can bring to the table if we all don't necessarily have as much faith, I think. If anyone were to get a tune back out of Rogic, we've got the right manager in charge for that that individual case. Uh, but I, I, if it was me, I would be saying right now, based on the four games, I would give Sorrow the benefit of the doubt, get him playing with McCarthy, who's going to show him how to do the role, really. I think with a far calmer head and, you know, time his tackles better and know which ones to go for and which ones not to. Just He just needs maybe, maybe Sorrow's just lacking a wee bit of experience right now. Um, he does seem to be a wee bit rasher, but for me, based on the form that I've seen from the three individuals in midfield, I would actually be saying it would be Turnbull. I would potentially take out the firing line for McCarthy and then put Cal Mack in the further forward position. Already scored um, in pre season, scored that World Day in Europe against Mitchelland. Looks more like it so far, and I think some of his best football is well, was under Rogers in the, in the first couple of seasons um when he was when he was chipping with a lot of goals so we know he's he's a good finisher we know that he can do that we know he's got the vision and the ability to play beautiful through balls and you know threaded passes for as we've already talked about fast fast paced attackers so i would be saying right now if it were me David Turnbull's peg is the sugar list. That's how I'll say it. Mm. Out of the three, the three players. Jim, does McCarthy give you that physicality in midfield that you've spoken about? You be happy to see him in there to, to bolster that midfield at the expense I'll be, of Turnbull yeah. Sorrow? I'll be honest, I haven't seen much of McCarthy. Uh, tend not to watch the English game. Uh, I haven't seen him play for Ireland. So I'm not exactly sure what he is going to bring to the game. I think... Uh, I think Angie's a bit of a dilemma. I, mean, I would always like to think, put your, put your best players on the park, but maybe the best players that we have don't maybe fit the Ange system. So it may be a kind of horses for courses type thing for Ange. Uh, as we said, Turnbull's a wee bit off it. He's the obvious one to maybe give a rest. I think Russell's spot on again with Sorrow. 
he's a bit of a hairless chicken in the last few games, which is very unlike him. Because I thought last season he was obviously one of one of the better players, but he seems no. to be running about daft, kicking people when he's going to get tons of yellow cards, and he has to watch that and be a wee bit more disciplined. Uh, we should never be playing uh, more than one holding midfield player at Parkhead. I think definitely go away from home. So I think maybe Ange has to mix it and match a wee bit, as I said earlier, because you know I think you've got a different type of game when you go away from Celtic Park. So McCarthy's definitely going to play. I mean, I don't think we're going to pay him that kind of money not to play. And my big uh, a concern is hopefully he keeps fit. Uh, and I'd read something about he's, he actually hasn't missed many games in the past couple of seasons. Maybe, maybe season's going past. He's missed a lot of games, but hopefully he's able to play, you know, 30 plus games and he contributes and makes a significant contribution. So I'm looking forward to seeing him play, but I think he'll be a first pick given the amount of money we've obviously invested in the lad. Uh, who drops out? I think it depends maybe who we're playing. Uh, does James McCarthy play the sorrow role? I'm not too sure. Does he get forward a bit more to play the Turnbull role? Can he do both? Is he that versatile? I don't know. I don't know, honestly. <laughs> no, because I haven't seen enough of him. So, looking forward to seeing what he brings to the party. Uh, but the more good players that we sign, the more options that we have. And we can mix and match it. And uh, it's good to have those options. And I think you guys said in the podcast last night, when you saw the three subs coming on, thinking, well, that's good. We've got that kind of mm. quality coming out of the park. And I think that's what we want every game. Yeah. And that's the bit about, you know, maybe harking back to the first thing I said on the pod today, was about the low legacy at halftime in Mitchell. And on comes a 19-year-old Centre half making his debut in a Champions League qualifier. We need to get as far away from that as possible, you know. So bring in more players, give us more options. And if David Turnbull's the unlucky guy to drop out, then that will give him maybe the wee kick up the backside he needs to perform a wee bit better um, mm-hmm. in the next game that he gives gives him a chance to play. I mean, it's definitely a, a work in progress, Russell, as we've seen going along. But uh, you know, th- there were signs last night that. No, lots of things to be positive about. Uh-huh. The, the usual frailties in defence, and we spoke about that with maybe adding a Gary Cahill type, you know, but that is something that has to be sorted, isn't it? Because you can't win every game 4 3 and 4 2 and 3 2, because there will be days when you might not score. But if you're, yes. still, if you're still conceding, you're going to lose, like you did against Hearts, like you did against Michelin, you know, so. And, Mm-hmm. I think it's a learning curve all round, doesn't it? Just the way we're going to play, and and it is he is working towards what he said, playing an exciting brand of football that will get the the fans off their seats, and it's building blocks that he's trying to put in. But you you have to deal with it here and now, and and, and win matches. Now he's got his first win, everybody can breathe a huge sigh of relief. And now you go into Dundee, as Tim says, you don't want to be too, don't want to be dropping any more league points. To be honest. No, absolutely not. I actually have to think that the the opposition we played last night, I I felt we will we will play a lot of better teams than that in our own domestic league. Um and yet whilst going forward I've been really, really positive about I felt the defense defensively the goals we conceded were disappointing. Um and could have proven more costly had we not been so you know get you know have to score four of our own goals as you say I don't think every day will be like that where we can rely on us scoring three four goals um, to win football matches I mean it's unrealistic really isn't it to go in with that that mindset but let's be honest he's trying to address it obviously um, he's, he's he's spoke about it as we, as we were alluding to at the start of the show he wants to you know us to be smarter um, so that would suggest to me that there will be changes made in the back line I just think right now um, it is important that the mistakes that are being made don't carry on being repeated for too much longer. Now, the reason I say that a lot of the time isn't necessarily even because I am. It's a it's a personal thing. You just know how the game works up here. Jim was alluding to it the earlier on in the show. You know, you need to get the points on the board. You want to be still within touching distance. Come, let's do it baby steps. By the end of the month, you want to be within three points. If we look at it like that way, and then we just look at it month by month. Now. To do that, you need to win games. And I just don't think the way we've defended, even again last night, so far fills me with loads of confidence on that. The flip side is, I think going forward, we look very good. I think James McCarthy enhances midfield. I think Joe Hart will in time enhance 
the defence as well as the actual position between the sticks. And hopefully we get a couple more uh, bodies in uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, across the back line because I think the, the full-back situation is looked at as well. Do you agree with that, Jim? We still need central defence and full-backs because our Achilles Hill is leaking goals. Nah, I mean, I think the goal we lost at Tynecastle, the second goal, uh, that's the thing we have to stop. And uh, other teams in the SPFL will know how we'll play and they'll know how to combat that. So we have to be clever enough to try and, you know, uh, get get by that. And uh, that's my wee concern. Because obviously, every team would have watched the game last week at Tyne Castle. So this is how you beat Celtic. You know, you just, you know, mm-hmm. pack your defence, don't do anything silly, hope you get a set piece. You know, play for a set piece yeah. if you can. That's the Achilles heel. So we have to get rid of the Achilles heel. Because if you get rid of that, then people won't actually play for that. So that's why I'm interested in this Sunday. How are we going to play at Celtic Park? Big, big park. I'm expecting a good result on Sunday. I think when away from home, we have to be tighter at the back. We have to have a defence and know what they're doing. We have to have that keeper in the two centre-backs, whether that's Cahill or not, who knows? We need an understanding between the three of Who comes for the ball? Who doesn't come for the ball? How all that thing works? And that's what you work on the training ground day after day after day. And what's good about this season is Ange is on the training ground. And there's not that disconnect. Because I felt last season, uh, Neil Lennon didn't get involved in the training. So how do you know what's happening? You know, That's a good John point. Kennedy's taking care of that. How do you know what's happening? Whereas Ange is there. I mean, I mean, Russell said earlier, he's on the podcast day after day after day. Multiply that by a big number. And that's what Ange is spending his time on Celtic. You know, because he's he's here to win. You know, and he's going to do everything he possibly can to win. And he, I mean, t- you know, we're just punters, right? What we know, multiply by a big number, and that's what Ange knows. He's been around the block a number of times. He knows what he has to do to fix this. And he'll do everything he can. And what I liked about the guy is he takes responsibility. And he's been very cute. Because the comment he made the other week about something like, uh, I've not maybe put my point across enough to the board to get the players in. He didn't just say, the board aren't backing me. He said, it's my fault. I really needed to make this, you know, obvious to these guys how bad this is. And I love that. I love that taking responsibility. So if anyone knows what's to be done, it's the big chap. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure he'll do what he has to be done. My concern is time. Time is an enemy. And it's not his fault. It's not his fault we waited, whatever it was, 100 and odd days to appoint a manager. Not his fault at all. So, I mean, I, I could, I could, uh, if I'm being picky, I could say maybe his subs, or maybe I've been a bit questionable, maybe the timing of the subs, maybe who's brought on. But that would be nitpicking. Uh, because of the legacy he's picked up, we need to get by. We need to get behind the big guy and Dom Mackay. In a three months' time, we're 25 points behind or whatever, then we can all go mad. You know, then we can all act hysterical because, you know, it's their fault then. It's not their fault just now. As I said earlier, and as Russell repeated there, just stay in it. Just stay in it. Don't don't fall too far behind. Give yourself a fighting chance. Get to Christmas no more than six points behind. Give yourself a fight. Because by Christmas time, you're hoping that the majority of that team are Ange's players and are playing in a system that Ange likes. <clears throat> and if he's managed to do what he's done in his previous clubs, it'll be quite good. And if we don't win the league, we don't win the league. But let's make a fight of it. Let's not do what we did last season where we just chucked it. And the board didn't help that by making poor decisions. So... We get behind the big man from, from which I think the fans have done. Mm-hmm. And as I said, that's my concern about Sunday. Let's let's all, you know, support the team and give them encouragement. And if we lose daft goals, then we can cheer even louder to try and drive them on because that's the most important thing just now, because time's time is Angie's enemy. So I agree with yeah, that. I've said my piece. Well, I'm going to flip what Jim said there, you know, we're talking about being three points or six points behind. What what's to say that Celtic won't be three points or six points in front? If they, get, <laughs> if they get any some kind of groove under and, and quickly, you know, because it's a slow burn, and I get that, but I mean, things could change very quickly, Tony. You're absolutely I, right. Yeah, things could yeah, yeah, things things change. I, I mean, money, you know, uh, and, and all yeah. of a sudden, you know, you, you could hit the ground running from there. That, that's what I mean. It's that's the fickle nature of football. <laughs> well, people talked about, aye, right. people talked about uh, 97, 98 season where Janssen loses the first two games, and they had the strongest team. Yeah. By a mile. So we, we were we were finished at that point in time. They had won ten in a row after two games. 
basically. Yeah. But circumstances dictated that they started dropping silly points and we managed to put a wee bit of a run together. And before you knew it, we were the top of the league. You know, so for, for all we know, our, our major rivals could drop some points on Saturday. We won five nothing. We go to Ibrooks and win all of a sudden we're top of the league. But from from a from a realistic point of view, oh, as long as we're no more than six points being come yeah, yeah. Christmas, then we're making a fight of it. If, it. if it's more than that in terms of a deficit, it's another long, hard season. Mm-hmm. So and we need to, as I said, put the building blocks in place now. Needs must get the guys in now, get the points on the board, so that by the time we get to Christmas, yep. as I said, that we're no more than six, say. To give us a chance, and then don't go to Dubai. There you go. There's my point. <laughs> we play on me on Sunday, Russell. Jim's really looking forward to it because he thinks there's something special going to happen. Do you expect Celtic to to gonna go all guns blazing and, and maybe have a real go at Dundee and, and score another four or five if they can? I definitely think they're capable of. Um, it's a, it's another newly promoted side that we've that they were playing. Um, I would like to think we will approach it like that. I think there's been an argument that we've had a lot, a lot of times, and I think you were sort of alluding to it, Jim, about when we play Celtic Park. You know, there's just no reason to have two holding midfielders. I can't see any reason why we don't play with two centre forwards at least when we're playing at home in the SPFL and ask questions of the opposition first and foremost. That's what we should be doing. Um, Whether he thinks we've got the personnel to do that, I'm not entirely sure. But I've liked what I've seen going forward anyway. I'm certainly expecting us to to grab the the bit between the teeth and and, and obviously try and put on a display for what will be a nearly half-full stadium, I believe which is obviously another sign of things going in the right direction. I think the fact they're coming on the back of a win, there'll be a positive energy in the air, everyone desperate to get us back to, to winning ways in the SPFL. And I think it's important as well that, yes, we had a bad result at Tynecastle, but we're going to need the fans this season, like Jim says, when they're in the in the stands. By all means, after the game, if, we, if we've had a bad result, Express your displeasure, but I think the players, there's a lot of new signings going to be in that team. A lot of players adapting to new surroundings, and we know that at times there's going to be occasions where we're either behind in a match or still level and we should have been winning. And I think those moments are going to become really important that we, we do stick together and the fans do get behind the team at those moments in time. And hopefully, we'll see some examples of that at the weekend. I'm expecting a a rousing victory, I've got to be honest. Now, there is a backdrop on Sunday of a protest against the board, and I wrote about this last night with Celtic getting a, their first victory on it, but scoring a, an own goal off it with the Jablonec tickets for the return leg. Mm-hmm. The fans being charged £19, and a lot of people were saying that surely Celtic should have offered that for nothing on the season books for the first time when everybody, a full house, are all going to be back in, the emotion of that occasion, a European tie under the lights, what a way to, to reconnect. But again, it just seemed to have scored a real own goal with, um, you know, it seems to me another disconnect. You know, you give the fans that for nothing in their season book. Jim, as you say, everyone buys into that. They get behind that and it's, it's a, it becomes an occasion. It becomes an event. And the emotion of that with, you know, all the, the fans back in the stadium. It, it was a real opportunity just to say, do you know what? It's been a terrible 18 months, but thanks. Have this game. Mm-hmm. Have this game on us. I mean, it just seems to me that that was the ultimate no-brainer. I don't know what your thoughts about that are, Jim. You probably do have a lot of thoughts on it. <laughs> I've loads of thoughts on that one, yeah. And I think there's, there's lots of issues that are tied into that. I think if fans aren't happy about things, they're quite right to demonstrate. <laughs> But I think they have to be clear about what they're demonstrating against and what they actually want to happen. Mm-hmm. And I think the demo on Sunday, for me, it's a bit vague. I mean, as I said, yeah. fans should be able to demonstrate. I've done it myself a long time ago. Uh, because I could understand the demonstration six months ago. Get rid of Lennon, get rid of Law. That's been done. Tick, tick. Same players. I love same players. So if ever you're going to demonstrate for something, you have to be very clear what your objectives are. And I saw the statement that came out was it was three or four weeks ago, you know, they're going to hold the board to account unless they do X, Y, and Z. It was all really vague, really, really vague. It wasn't, you know, how do you how do you actually measure that stuff? You can't measure that stuff, you know. So you have to be quite specific, you know. 
by all means demonstrate absolutely fine, but actually be clear what you're demonstrating against and who you're demonstrating against. Because the thing I don't know, understandably, is, is how things work at Celtic Park. In terms of the delegation of authority at Celtic Park, you know, if you're the chief executive, then you've been delegated by the board to run the club as you see fit. And they don't interfere with that. Unless you go above that level, and I don't know where that level is. Right. So you want to buy new pens for the office. You don't go to the board and say it's okay to buy new pens for the office. I can I can do that. If you want to sign a player for a million pound, do you go to the board for that? I wouldn't think so. A new manager, maybe you go to the board with that. So, so I'm not kind of sure who makes these decisions. So it's always difficult to then say, <laughs> I'm blaming you for this. <laughs> when in fact, it's not them at all. And they talk yeah. about the Celtic board, it's full of Tories. You take something like Brian Wilson, <laughs> politician, socialist, <laughs> club historian, you know, you know, get him out. What has he done wrong? <laughs> Specifically, what has he done wrong? I don't know. So why am I saying Brian Wilson out? I'm not because I don't know. And I defended Gavin Strachan last year, one of the few voices, because I don't know what he does, and you get pass marks in an internal review. So if you're going to protest, you need to know who you're protesting against and what you actually want next. To answer your question, because that was a bit of a tangent there, as I usually do, right? Mm -hmm. That must be the chief executive's call. £19 for the game. He's called that wrong. He's called that miles wrong. Now, so that's, that's not good for me, because as I said earlier... I want to support Don Mackay. I want to give him time. I want to get behind him. But as you said, Tony, it's a no-brainer. No-brainer at all. Because in actual fact, us scoring the fourth goal last week maybe wasn't good for getting a big crowd in because we know the game, the tie is done, basically. But it's 3-2. You know, mm. that maybe a bump the crowd up a bit. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, personally, I know a lot of Celtic fans who are not going next week because they'll find it on a feed if it's not on TV as it is. Why pay 19 pounds? Even though they're desperate to go. Desperate to go. And as I said, I was at the Mitchell Land game and, and it, 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 the atmosphere was, was, was really, really poor. You know, it sounded good on TV, but you know you could hear every kick of the ball, you hear the players shouting at each other, you hear the manager. That, that, that mad manager at Mitchell Land just, just clapped the whole game. <laughs> Wasn't a good atmosphere. Different on Sunday. 25,000 on Sunday. Be brilliant next week with a full house. So why are you charging 19 pounds? Why are you, just, you know, shoot yourself? Another thing about Don McKay, we understand he likes to engage with the fans. My question would be, why? Why did you charge nineteen pound when you could have done what you just said, Tony? We're all in this together, guys. In you come, fill your boots. It's the uh, biggest chance most, you connect, isn't it? I, I'm also interested to see how it actually works from a COVID point of view, yeah. because I went to the game, went to the Michelin game, and you were meant to wear masks, but very few people did wear masks, and they announced over the over the PA because I think they have to do that anyway. You know, please wear a mask. And the stewards were never going to tell you, put your mask on, you know, they're not going to involve in that. So I'm interested to see how the whole COVID thing works. After the 9th of August, are we saying all bets are off, therefore you can do you, or do you have to wear a mask in the stadium? Who's going to do that? Social distancing. So that'll be interesting to see how that works. But to answer your question, huge own goal, huge own goal. Russell, do you agree with that huge own goal? Yeah, I think it was a no-brainer from a PR position. It's just another another one in a catalogue of errors that we've seen uh, recently, to be honest with you. I don't actually get the the need for the instant cash anyway. You know what I mean? Whatever it is they're looking to generate by doing so. I mean, obviously, any opportunity the club can make, they want to make money. I get that. But for me, this one was the one that you would give a buy to and think of the bigger picture. The bigger picture is... There was a protest last season. Um, there was a disconnect. This season, there has been still some unrest. I see just all that aside, morally, there's Celtic supporters out there in the last 12 months have spent £1,200 of their hard-earned money and not seen one football match yet. And yet it's going to go up to £1,219 now to watch, the, to watch us play in, in a tie that already looks... Settled, if we're being honest. I mean, you never know with us, don't I get too carried away? But I just think that, I just think that real, realistically, that to me, you go, we cannot wait to welcome you back to Celtic Park. We can't wait to welcome you back, bring your season ticket along, and you get in for free. That's how excited we are. And they'll still make revenue from what people will buy when they are in the ground. I'm going to guess that 
if there's a full house, then all the stalls and all that will be back open. So, I mean, I just don't, I don't get the logic behind it. It looks to me a wee bit penny pinching. It's, it's a bad decision. And if it's really, if there is a real need for us to generate the funds that, you know, a half full Celtic Park sell nineteen pound tickets will do, then maybe we need some more transparency of the the current financial situation we're in, and maybe then. If it is a case that we're desperate for money, we would understand a bit more. My hunch is, though, that it's penny pinching of the highest order. It is a slap in the face to fans that have bought not just one, but two season tickets without seeing any football as of yet in the last, what, 18 months? Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's just come on. And do you know what? Remember, I know you were saying it's the CEO's decision. He, they, This is disgust. These decisions aren't just made by one man. It might have been his idea to do it. Who knows? But you then run it past people, and they still came to that decision. I find that fascinating. Yeah, I think also point the point I was trying to make was I've seen lots of comments on social media. Typical Celtic board. I don't think it's a Celtic board. And the point I'm trying to make is that if you're not happy about something and you want to demonstrate about something, then know who your target is. And I don't think the nineteen pound for this game next week is to do with the Celtic board. It's the chief executive, and I think uh, that's the bit of understanding how things work I, mean, mm-hmm. I think it's dead easy to jump in a bandwagon and start blaming people mm-hmm. and it's not their fault you know I think it's an own goal it's, it's, it's said by Tony there and the own goal came for Don Mackay and I'm surprised yeah I have to say I'm surprised by that as well finally guys we'll just want to get your predictions for Sunday how do you see it going Russell 3-0 Three 0 Three we're going to keep a clean sheet yep no, clean no. sheet for Joe Hart all other. Jim yourself I'll 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 see your three and raise it by two five now. Oh, 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 oh. Well, well. Rip roaring, free scoring, Rip roaring. never boring. Free scoring, never boring. Yeah. Yes. I'll say three one because I I don't know for the stage we're not capable of keeping a clean sheet, but we'll we'll soon see. We'll reconvene. This has been the the Friday Three Amigos show with the different Three Amigos. Yes, and if you haven't oh. done so already, yes, Jim, do you want to plug Bend, bend it like Bertie? Go if anyone's on, not seen the, the Axon Bender like Bertie special, you have to watch Des McLean, whose impersonations and improvisation are nothing short of spectacular. So if you get a chance, you get to hear the background to Bender like Bertie and then just watch the one of the funniest people around Des McLean. <clears throat> Sorry. Good reminder, also. No worries. If you haven't bought tickets for Bender like Bertie, then you better do it soon because they are selling out fast, aren't they? Jim? Thanks, Dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, uh, thanks for joining. Cheers, Tony. Cheers.